for melodic heavy metal. Playing it heavier. Louder. Raunchy. Faster. This is the signals of intuition. I'm living in a state of fallen grace. You're listening to the signals of intuition, your home for Melana Card Rock and Heavy Metal. And that right there was Archon Angel, the leadoff single and title track from their new album, Fallen. Archon Angel feature Zach Stevens behind the microphone. You might know him from Sabotage, Trans Siberian Orchestra, or Circle to Circle. Archon Angel being his new band. He formed with Aldo and Marco from Secret Sphere, the Italian power metal band. And from the French power metal band Nightmare, we have bassist Yves Campion. Tonight on the show, we have the singer of that band, Zach Stevens. Let's get Zach on the line right now. Hey, Zach, how's it going? It's Brandon from the Signals of Intuition. Good. How are you? Can you hear me? Good. Yep, I can hear you. Uh, I'm trying to get the right buzz. (laughs) He's got these things stacked. You know, the interviews are just stacked on top of each other, and like people are... I'm trying to finish up the previous one, and it's so funny. But anyway, sorry about that. (laughs) It's mayhem. Oh, I know. It's funny, I've got quite a lot here, but I think we can probably trim this and get through it. I think you're okay, and if it takes a few minutes, it's okay. The last one actually got pushed back a little, so I think you have a few spare minutes, so you may be able to get through everything if I'm not too long-winded, so yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, let's dive right in. So when I do these, I like to always start at the beginning of you as a musician and then work our way up to the new record. Okay. So where did you grow up and how did you get started in music? I grew up in uh, West Columbia, South Carolina. It's kind of, you know, a very small town at that time. Now the traffic is horrible. Uh, everybody the found ca- it. Is that part of the capital or near the capital? It's just west of Columbia. It is its own city. It's just, you got Columbia downtown which is one of those towns where everybody goes and works. And then at the end of the day, total abandonment. There might You, you can hear a pin drop downtown at night. <laughs> it's just one of those. Everybody works down there, but they don't live down there. Then West Columbia is on a little Highway 378 coming out west of Columbia, and that's it. And that's where everything's expanding to. So ah, if you're continuing heading out west like that, you've got all these communities building up, and it's just like, over the years, everybody found it. You know, like the way it is in South Carolina, especially Columbia, they tried to keep it a secret. You know, if anybody asks about it, you don't want to come here. It's not. It's a sleepy town. Uh, yeah, it's not any good. Bye. Knowing that it was a great place to be, you know. So it was a great place to grow up in the suburbs of Columbia in the 70s and 80s. The greatest time ever. I mean, I I, pro- I had such a great childhood growing up and. You know, and when I was nine years old, one of my best friends, David Campbell, his big brother who was in high school at the time, we're 10 and he's in high school. So you see the age difference, probably about five or seven years older, came to me and my brother, who's one year younger than me, Nick. And he said, you guys are going to form a band because we found out about that talent show at your school. Okay, now we were probably hiding from that. As a matter of fact, at the time, so at Saluda River Elementary in West Columbia, I'm in fifth grade. My brother's in fourth grade. My friend David Campbell's in fifth grade. So here comes Chuck, his big brother, probably a junior in high school. Hey, we know about that talent show, and you guys are going to form a band and go win that thing. And I went, what? Okay, whatever. So we didn't have a choice. So I look at my music career starting as like, I was told to do it by Chuck. So he said, who wants to play what? Well, we already know David's taking guitar. David plays guitar like me. You know, this is Chuck. Chuck. And I said, well, I hate guitar. I've already been taking lessons. I had already been taking guitar lessons at the time, and I didn't like it at all. Everybody thought that was a natural progression. My mom's like, go take guitar lessons. I don't know what the big push was. Everybody was just pushing, pushing us to do music. So, Were you big into music then? At that point, like, was that why I she was kind of music? I did. I from the time I was like bouncing up and down in a crib, my mom had every classic rock album of the sixties and seventies blasting. 
we had one of those big hi-fi systems with the turntable and the you know pioneer speakers and you know whatever Altec whatever receivers and they were big audio files so gosh I'm you know I'm having to listen to you know, Three Dog Night Chicago uh, God you name it I mean I- everybody so the first time I asked for a single record I told my mom I want that Joker the Joker by Steve Miller okay so I'm like six so I said go get me Steve Miller band. So she, you know, that was my first single that I was actually purchased for myself. I was stealing all the other singles, you know, from everybody. So we just had a ton of records. I mean, just like, oh, my God, from everything from Motown to, oh, it was just like everything imaginable. I think the first album I was ever given was Frampton Comes Alive. Oh, okay. Yeah, of course. Was, yeah. You're not responsible enough. You've had singles, but you're not responsible enough for an album to take care of it. So you can't get one until you're responsible enough not to ruin it. Okay, here comes Frampton Comes Alive, and don't ruin it. Take good care of it. Here's the sleeve. Here's everything. All right, okay, I promise I'm responsible enough. But anyway, we put the band together. I, I said, I want to play drums. You know, so, okay, go off with what's his name. I forgot, a Larry, and we'll do a drum lesson. Can you play this beat? And then I went right away. I could play the beat, and he's like, you're kind of a natural. I was like, cool, because believe me, I wasn't a natural at guitar. That was like coming the hardest possible as it could come. So I'm like, okay, so we got some Eagle songs together. Lion Eyes was the first song I played on stage in front of people. I was about to faint, drop my drumsticks, and throw up at the same time. That was a feeling I had. It was like the triple whammy. Faint, throw up, drop the sticks, fall straight back off the drum throne. But then that was as the curtain was opening up. Oh, my God. So we play that, and then we played a Kiss song, uh, Calling Dr. Love, maybe. And then Brick House by the Commodores. Oh, yeah. You just have to go down, 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 uh, down, 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 uh, 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 you know, whatever. So that was the three songs. Now, the contingent belief amongst all the other fifth graders was that was taped. There's no way they could have played that. So that was the big, you know, rumor. Where's the tape player? Of course, that's ridiculous thinking. It's a 10 year old brain and you can't fake it. We had amps and everything. And we had, I sang through, the thing I sang through was a bass cabinet because it had the right, <laughs> so I sang through like a giant bass cabinet while we played bass through the other speaker and the guitar was like in a, like a PV, no, a Fender Twin Reverb. <laughs> it's hilarious because my own very first show was through, was singing through a bass cab as well. That's so funny. See? You got to do, you got to, you know, do what you can do. Yeah, I mean, that's before you have a PA, you use what you got, right? And guess what? We won the talent show. The winner is Aries Band. Of course, when you have a name after the, you know, your uh, astrological sign, then you you know you're in. But um, but that's not my sign. I'm, I'm actually Pisces, so I don't know how in the hell we got the one after that. Uh, that was cool. That gave me the bug. And then a month later after that, guess what? I see my first concert. That happens to be Kiss on the Destroyer tour. So then I'm really done now. Oh, you give up. You're now completely captured. You know, you're in rock and roll jail and you must be. So I think that was the two things that, and all but within months of each other and at the age of, you know, 10. It's funny because I think it was about, I was about the so, age of ten too, and I dis- was discovered uh, Kiss Destroyer, and that that was the album for me that was like, holy crap! Okay, I I love this, you know. So, yeah, I completely understand. Right, exactly. You know, so that's really easily in a nut- and then after that, I was like, okay, where well, I need a drum set now. Who's gonna get me that drum set? And I badger my dad. And he finally come off with this black uh, Slingerland drum kit, and I had that for like five years until you know. Again, prove that you can be responsible and you'll get Ludwig, okay, which is the finest drum. Nobody can even be endorsed by those guys. I mean, it's like you look at them as like the echelon, I guess, with like Sonar yeah, or whatever, Sonar being German contingent and then Ludwig. So all these German names, I would imagine Ludwig is German and probably was a German family that moved over here. Um, yeah, well, you, yeah, you think like, of, I mean, the, the ultimate snare drum is a superphonic, you know. Superphonic so. Black Beauty. Yeah. Or do you like Superphonic? Because here's what just happened to me. That was my Christmas present this year, by the way. I The six and a half inch deep Superphonic snare. Because I always had the five inch one. 
I had the five inch deep for 20 years on my kit on that one I got when I was like 14. And it was a great snare, just the regular five inch deep superphonic, you know, the little one with the same aluminum. I don't even know what it is, brass or aluminum shell. I know silver, but um, so look at my age. Okay. I'm 53. What's my Christmas present? The six and a half deep. Then what do I do? I find out for only about 160 something dollars that it can be now upgraded to the superphonic black beauty. So guess what's on order and back ordered waiting for my black beauty. I'm seriously waiting on the five. It is back ordered to the end of April. I'm like, what? How many black beauty snare drums do y'all have to make? Guitar center says I can't get it. And then they wanted to sell me the floor model, which is scratched up. And I know you get a drum key with the, you know, if you get it new in the box, but not that I'm doing everything for a drum key, but still, you know, you get extra stuff. So I'm actually waiting on, it's so funny you bring that up. I'm waiting on my back ordered Black Beauty right now. <laughs> I got to have it. Uh, you know, yeah. like, sorry. So you, you still play drums then, eh? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I play all the time. I've been playing drums since the day I started singing. I started singing and playing drums the same day. Have you played drums in a band? I'm guessing probably in the beginning, but I mean, sort of like, you know, since, say, Wicked Witch and Onward kind of thing. No, well, no, I played the drums on most of the Circle to Circle albums. And then, of course, we had to tour with other drummers. So we, you know, in the lineup, it would be another drummer. I played in multiple bands. I mean, just growing up, I mean, geez, it was probably something like 14 bands, you know, just from middle school to high school and in college, a couple of them. But it was all local you know, just stuff getting out there. And mainly I sang, but I sang backup vocals and some lead vocals like Eagles. I would try to be Don Henley, of course, you know, look like Don Henley playing drums and singing. And and I would even sometimes show off and play Rush songs and play Rush and sing Getty Lee's part and play Neil Peart. But then again, after about three of them, I said, uh, yeah, physically, I'm about to die. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I didn't really try to take that on past, like, the age of, like, 27. But, no, and, and you try to get it right, but, I mean, believe, you know how that goes. Um, it's, it's impossible as a yeah, guitar yeah, player who just, sings oh, as well. Man. I mean, there, there are songs you're just – I don't know how the I, – I have so much respect for people who drum and sing because I think of how many times you sing and the rhythm of what you're singing is day and night to what you're drumming. And it's That's like right. that, that just blows my mind if you can do that. And And, you know, I got really good at it for the most part. And now when I go back and do it, I find myself kind of hanging on the drum rhythm a little bit. Maybe, Wait a minute. That's not the – why did I – you know, <laughs> I'm changing the rhythm of the vocals here. So you really have to get back in touch with it. And uh, But it is something that came – you know, again, I didn't have to struggle too much with it, and you can develop it over time. So I would like to do that. And, and you know, it's always good to hone those skills again. And, you know, but then when I got into singing, it just – you know, everybody wanted to pull me up front. And then I had to say a tearful goodbye – to the drum kit for the most part in, but you know, I still get to play sometimes. Like we just played 70,000 tons of metal that, you know, the metal ship with 60 metal bands. Like, yep. I had a few friends on that and they, they saw you guys play Archon Angel. Oh, cool. And I also played on drums on a couple of songs in the all-star jam. This year I got mother by Danzig and I got, I want out by Halloween. Oh, nice. Oh, that's so cool. I know, and per, you know, I was pretty happy with it. I got everything, the tempo, you know, you got to hold that tempo back on I Want Out. It tries to go faster than it should, you know, so I really was like, oh, God. So you just got to have little things you got to watch out. But, um, yeah, a lot of fun. So I still get out there sometimes and want to show people the other side, and they're always a little surprised, like, what? What are you doing up there? They thought they were announcing the lineup wrong when they looked at the original thing when we signed up for the All-Star Jam because the girl from Canada, she got back to me and said, did you fill out the wrong spreadsheet? And I'm like, why? No, you've got yourself on drums. And I went, that's right. Okay, wow, I thought you filled it out wrong. No, <laughs> you filled it out wrong because people don't expect it. They're like, they don't know that I have that as many years in drums as vocals, you know. But um, it's a lot of fun. God, it's so fun. When I'm up there, I'm like in heaven. Then I have to stop playing. And then it's like, oh, it's kind of like a little sad moment. 
then you head over to the bar and drown your sorrows. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, okay, so let's jump around really quick. I know we're already starting. To I know. I already. Time. Yeah, I know. Don't worry. You're going uh, you're to be awarded more good. minutes. So just continue. <laughs> let you know how many minutes you're rewarded. Okay. Um, all right. Tell me a little bit about Wicked Witch. I've loved this demo for you. I didn't even know you sang on it when I first discovered the band, believe it or not. So tell me a bit about that band. How'd you form, you know, like the demo? Did you guys go and do that with a producer or was that just something you guys threw together? Tell, tell me about that. Well, it depends on which one you have. Now, we did have Bob St. John, who was the guy who worked very closely with Extreme back in the day, the other the big Boston band. Mm -hmm. And we were in Boston. So we enlisted the help of Bob St. John. That might be the one you're, that had Soul to Fire. And yep. Yeah, Soul to Fire, Breakdown. Uh, oh, God, I'm blanking. I'm, I'm trying to remember what was on that versus what was on Machine, Machines of Grace, but I think most of the songs were on both, That's right. if I'm not mistaken. That's right. So the early one was uh, kind of produced and mixed by Bob St. John, and, you know, real fast recording session. We didn't have a lot of money, and, you know, you have to get everything done real fast and blah, blah, blah. But that was, you know, obviously an in-studio effort. There's other stuff out there that was just probably done through the board through Jeff Plate had a mixing board back there that he, you know, maybe about eight channel thing that you might even hear some early demos like that. You, I'm sure you'd be able to tell the difference in the quality. But, but yeah, that's how that one came about. We just wrote songs and we played all the time up in Boston. Like, I mean, gosh, we were like playing so many shows back in the day. It was kind of like when metal was kind of getting pushed out by grunge. <laughs> that time frame, 90, 91, 92, you know? Yeah. So we didn't really have much of a chance of getting signed, but then when we wanted to take it and re and, and, and change the name and we did Machines of Grace and then re-recorded them, then we were actually, it still was an independent self-released thing for the most part, but I was happy with getting in there, you know, recording them the right way and, and having a nice sounding thing and you know taking old songs and putting them to new production you know that was kind of the the most satisfying thing about it but you know this year is really sad on the note on the note of machines of grace and wicked witch because we lost our guitar player you know matt left he battled cancer for so long probably upwards of a decade oh geez yeah brain yeah he just passed away like in probably mid-january yeah um oh, so and he was the that. guitar player you hear yeah no for, hey thanks yeah, he's the he was the guitar player you hear on all that. That's Matt Leff. He even auditioned for Ronnie James Dio back in the day. I think it was Craig Goldie that got it. He was looking for you know new guitarists at the time. So, or it could have been Rowan Robertson. That I'm not sure exactly, but he came close. So very talented, and you know he got brain cancer somehow, and it went to his lungs, and then back and forth. And he was on. He was really courageous because he said that, hey, I'll be a guinea pig for all the experimental cancer drugs out there because, I, you know what, I don't have anything to lose. Most of the newest drugs, you know, he actually did experimental treatments with them so that they can be in further development. So he gave a lot and battled and just, gosh, an amazing story of how much he battled against that. He held on for much longer than than anybody expected. And it was just tragic, you know, so... That's a kind of a sad note about the whole, you know, unfortunately, it kind of leaves us with a sad note as far as all the Wicked Witch and, and uh, Machines of Grey stuff, you know, this year. Right, right, right. Well, I'm glad, too, you guys were able to properly release that as well. I think that was, what, a year or two ago that came out? Well, that the, the Machines of Grey, of course, came out in 2009, and then Matt, it was pretty much the last thing that Matt wanted to see happen, and I'm really glad he did it. You know, he probably knew a little bit more than we would know as far as the full impact of why he wanted to get that out there. But when he said he wanted to put it out in 2018 or last year, even, I don't know if it was, it could have been the early part of last year, or 2018, the latest release. We were like, absolutely go ahead, get it on out there. And uh, we're all for it. So stepping back kind of to the early nineties, tell me what happened. Were you still in wicked witch when you got the call to join sabotage? How did that happen? Yeah, we were playing up there from like 98, later part of 89, 90, um, 91, and in, on into 92. So we had probably a second lineup 
we had an original band, and then the lineup kind of changed a little bit to bring Jeff Plate in on drums, about 90, you know, around there somewhere. So we were chugging away, just kept, you know, playing shows, playing shows, and, you know, had a demo made with Bob St. John. So that was all I had. So, you know, I heard from back in Tampa, I had met the Sabotage guys a couple of times, once in L.A., when I was going to school out there, uh, the vocal school. Oh, did, uh, did you go to MIT? Yeah, I went to VIT. I was in the first ever class. I was in the first class they had. Oh, you're kidding me. So that right right on the Sunset Strip, right there, right? That's right. It was on it was Hollywood, Hollywood Boulevard. Or, or sorry, yes, yes, you're right, it is Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. And I was living in Hollywood, yeah. I went to the first class they, they had of VIT. I was in class number one. Uh, it was a six-month program. They had a big fat manual, and they said, we're going to teach you all this in six months, but it'll take you about seven years to internalize it. So you want to hear a chorus of boos from the first class? Boo! We want to be rock stars now. Well, <laughs> that's just not the way it goes. And really, about seven years down the line, probably sitting about dead winter, dead sabotage time in 96, I kind of looked down at my watch, and it was like, damn, I'll be damned. They were just about right. I really kind of feel like I just now mastered all that stuff. It took about seven years to internalize all that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's not a fast process. It's a lifelong thing, you know, vocals and stuff. So um, you're always learning. You'll never know everything. And oh, you have God. Yeah, stuff. I hear you. I'm a fellow singer, so believe me, I, I learn stuff yeah, all the time about my that. voice. <laughs> oh, can't do that and sing like that tomorrow. Okay. Right. And, you know, it's all you're picking up stuff all the time. You just have to be, like I tell my students, I say, if you're okay with two things, you're going to learn for the rest of your time you sing in your life. And number two, are you okay that you'll never know everything? And if you can say yes to both of them, then I'll invite you into the vocal lifestyle. If you're not comfortable with those two things, then bow out now. You know you know how that is. But yeah, I was. I had the demo, the original Wicked Witch demo. It had like three, three songs on it. So that's all I had. So I sent it down there when we heard that John was going to step back and do like the, more of the producer role. So... And it turns out they got about 50 or something, you know, it was cassette tapes back then for the most part, demos and stuff. And then I heard back, they said, hey, good job. You know, you're the only one who didn't try to sound like John. So we're actually interested in that. So I, I didn't have a choice. I felt like, oops, I should have sounded more. I felt like the whole time, oh, man, this is going to be no good because I'm just doesn't I just don't sound like John. But that turned out to be a plus because everybody was sending demos trying to be John, and they didn't, you know, they didn't like it. So it kind of got me to a, a point where I could go audition in person with Paul O'Neill in Queens. Oh, so you're living in Boston? You drove up to New York then, eh? Well, down, yeah, down. Uh, or down, so, sorry, yeah. <laughs> four hours, something like that. Yeah, and then uh, sat in his apartment and sang with him, playing acoustic guitar and stuff, just jamming, just playing different things, whether Beatles or Bad Company or whatever. And then he said, good, all right, I'll let you know. And then he, I got called about two or three weeks later and said, come down again. I want to go over some more specific stuff I'm kind of putting together for this record to see how that, so, you know, he had stuff, um, I guess, um, follow me. I remember him playing, you know, don't need no superheroes, don't need no movie stars, or what would eventually become follow me. Mm -hmm. He kind of had that a little bit, and he goes, try that you know, the octave up. So he goes, all right, cool. Well, I tell you what, you're not in yet, but come down to Tampa and we'll get you in rehearsals. And if all that kind of works out, then you can probably be okay. So I was still, I came down in like August or the end of July of 92. And he, he said, you, we're going to put you up in a hotel for a few weeks. And then, you know, you just keep working in rehearsals. And, you know, if everything works and the guys say thumbs up, then you'll be in good shape and maybe we can make a final decision. So I was still leaving in rehearsals, not even knowing if I was in the band, you know? <laughs> oh, that's unreal. Yeah. So you just have to keep plugging away. It was like, wow. But I kind of felt like I was gaining ground, you know, cause everybody liked me and you know, Johnny Lee, he's dad's from Tennessee. My dad's from Tennessee. Uh, he's real, you know, kind of Southern I'm from South Carolina. And you know, the guys, Oliva's had been Florida people for quite a long time, even though their roots come from New York, uh, New York City. So everybody got along pretty good, and then it finally worked out, and we had all the songs for Edge of Thorns rehearsed, and Paul said, all right, 
You know, I think they threw it once back to the management at the time. The guy, John Goldwater, who was managing the band at the time, I think he kind of was managing uh, Clutch was another band he managed for a while. Uh, oh, yeah. So that was before we switched over to Krebs Communication, which is now Krebs Communication is Night Castle Management. It, it was the same people. So it was kind of like a transition from Lieber and Krebs, the early management that had Ted Nugent and Joan Jett and oh Aerosmith that's how Paul O'Neill got into the business is because Lieber and Krebs Paul O'Neill was working for the Lieber and Krebs management and they handed him live tapes of Aerosmith and said Paul can you go in the studio and make a double album for all this live tape stuff well that became Live Rocks 1 and 2 and that was the first records that Paul ever produced so that's how Paul got to start in the business. So we have the people who are old now, but were young, young people at Krebs Communications because Fran Lieber retired, and David Krebs made it Krebs Communications, and then that, and then the people, basically the people who are the higher management personnel over TSO and Sabotage now, these are the guys who were young working for Krebs Communications back in the early '90s, and maybe even coming from Lieber and Krebs as young interns. And these are the people who are now the senior management of TSO now. Ah, okay. And it's called Night Castle because Paul O'Neill renamed it and basically said, hey, my old team, my old place I worked, we're going to now call it Night Castle and you guys manage TSO. So it worked out very neatly. And it was from where Paul came from. Well, yeah, I mean, even, you know, you look on all the um, all the TSO CDs, for example, at least the newer ones, all say Night Castle right there as yes. well. Yes, so. and that's my bosses, um, basically who I'd report directly to. So, Do they manage you solo and... Uh-uh. Nope. No, just, so, just, the just the band. TSO. Yep. So when you work for them, you're employed by them, but you're not being individually managed like that. Uh, I see. Yeah, I could go out and get an individual personal manager. Basically, I think I just signed a contract with my wife to be my manager because I act so much like a toddler. <laughs> so now I'm under toddler management, uh, Inc., uh, which is my – no, I'm just kidding. But, but uh, well, you got to get incorporated, of course. Of course. <laughs> well, if toddlers are incorporated, that's me. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. But um, but uh, feel young. Uh, be older, but feel young. Okay, that's kind of our logo. Um, but no, we. it's good because, you know, I understand kind of sort of why you have this stuff like Ronnie Dio with his wife as the manager, Wendy, and then you've got Jeff Tate and his wife is his manager. You know, these are real things that exist in the business. So I can kind of get it now, you know. I like it. I mean, no, I don't. It's not official, but you know, I can see where <laughs> where it becomes that way. So, to, oh, how about Ozzy Osbourne, Sharon yeah. Osbourne, right? Hey, so I, I get it. I get it. You know, it's good to have another person in the think tank. You know, well, for sure, especially someone who you know you essentially report to every day, right? So I mean, they've been around it long enough to have opinions and know how things work as well. Especially around the house, you get scolded. It's it, you know, you get things like that. It's great. You know, like, you're not doing it. You know. No, it's it's awesome, and you know it's not really that same kind of arrangement like you would have with some of those other examples. But just just having a sounding board and working through so and somebody who shares the musical thing, it works out great. And obviously, we work on these records together now, so it, it's cool. It's really cool. Oh, that's awesome. So when it comes to Edge of Thorns, you mentioned you know a couple songs were finished. Did you have a lot of input as far as like writing and stuff, or was everything pretty much ready to go by the time you started rehearsals with them? Yeah, it was pretty. It was getting there. I mean, they they came up with some ideas in rehearsals, like Edge of Thorns. The song was kind of you know that's an idea that John came up with, kind of in the rehearsal uh, with that dun 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 the opening piano riff. He thought it sounded like The Exorcist, and I was like, um, yeah, uh, I guess, or and it was even Friday the Thirteenth. Maybe he was saying it sounded like it. <laughs> With uh, Michael Myers, I'm like I can only see images of Michael Myers. So I'm like, yeah, sort of, yeah. But of course, it was. It was not exactly like that. Um, so that one, and then they everybody started jamming on it. You know, the riff, and you know, some of the stuff was built right there. And that song, we had two completely different vocal melodies too. You know, I kept having to sing, you know, the one you know now. 
and then there was one that was completely different in the verses. So I had to really get both those down, and we had to make a really hard decision between both of them. And I, I remember my, you know, my opinion at the end, the one we have now. I said, I just like that better. It breathed, you know. So he goes, okay, okay. I mean, it was just always like these painful decisions that nobody knows about. It was one like Scraggy's Tomb. That's one that me and Chris Oliva basically wrote at his house, like at one night, just hanging out. You know, he's going, dun, 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 you know, the kind of Ted Nugent sort of, you know, to me, the the Scraggy's Tomb riff. Um, and then I named it that. I said, Scraggy, Scraggy, oh, that's what we called his dog. His dog is named Max. So he called him Scraggy all the time. Come here, Scraggy. I don't know why he called Max Scraggy all the time. And then, of course, I'm trying to put something heavy with Scraggy. It was just a working title. So I said, oh, where do dogs go when they, you know, when they die, they go into Scraggy's tomb. You know, and we laughed about that, and it was ridiculous. I mean, that explains our whole thing. You know, always laughing, being ridiculous. So Paul O'Neill sees, he goes, who got that Scraggy tomb? I said, me. I was just a, we just were coming up with something as a working title. He goes, I like that. You know, I can kind of like, we're going to make him an alcoholic, and I'm going to write a story. And I'm like, wow, he actually used my title and then wrote a song about kind of an alcoholic after that. <laughs> and he, he made Scraggy a person. Summer was the season when he took a ride. Something was the reason. Uh, I don't even know. I can't I believe it. I cannot even recall the words exactly. But he did, he twisted it, and I'm like, wow, that's cool. And and my melody, you know, that whole the whole vocal melody there, mm-hmm. that was something I came up with. So I was like, wow, all right. So me and Chris just worked really good together. So I mean, it was even further adds to the tragedy of losing him because we were just starting to kind of really gel nicely, writing stuff. And you know, I was over to his house like almost a hundred percent of the time. So you got you guys really became um, really close very early on. Yep, it was really a great thing. Had a lot of great times, and I mean, geez, we were in the car I had at the time. It was a Chevy. Oh man, they don't make them anymore. Uh, <laughs> and this dude in front of us just decided to slam. It was a guy in a four-wheel truck, really up high, and he just decided to slam it in reverse and go as fast as he could. And you're watching him come straight at you, and he just smashed into us. Then he takes off. So. He completely bashed in the hood of the car because he's so high up. I thought he was going to bounce right off and come straight through the windshield at us. The truck was so high up. But it, it just stunned us. And we were like, what in the what in the hell is going on? So it was like in Clearwater. We were just kind of going to a friend's house and maybe to a club and something else. And he just takes off. So I kind of like take off and go kind of like try to get his license tag or whatever. And I think we got it, and then I backed off because I didn't want to. I didn't know what we're dealing with, you know, if he's going to start shooting out the back of the truck or. So then we called nine one one, and they basically, a cop was sitting at Dunkin' Donuts, and saw that truck zoom by, and after we called it in, and it was a Pinellas County, yeah, Pinellas County Sheriff saw him and then tracked him down it took three or four cops he they were he was running from the cop he didn't want to stop it took about three or four of them to kind of pin him in and make him blast and wreck into something on the in the shoulder and uh so it turned out he had empty whiskey bottles in the truck and and he was completely drunk you know didn't have any idea what he was doing we had to identify the truck and the driver, so they brought us by sheriff car up to the arrest scene. So we had to, uh, you know, identify the truck, which they saw the paint. They saw the red paint on the bumper and everything. So they just needed a positive ID. So we ID'd him, and they, you know, he wound up. And we didn't know if he had insurance or anything. So basically, I couldn't really do a claim or anything. He went straight to jail and stayed in jail for two months because of all the charges. So I thought he was didn't have any insurance. I, I was like, there's no way this guy's insured. So we finally, after two or three months, he's let out of jail, and we find out he has State Farm. I'm like, <laughs> amazing, I got State Farm. <laughs> so I was actually able to get the car completely repaired. 
but he did have a hit and run charge and he had running you know running from the uh you know resisting arrest they had to be they had to hog tie the guy with his hands behind his onto his feet behind his back oh crazy and throw him in the cop car like bowling <laughs> i witnessed it because he was so disorderly that he, they had to get like two guys to go one two three <laughs> and slam the door Oh, so man. that was just one of the many adventures that me and Chris had to go through to get through together. <laughs> oh, that's unreal. You probably could and should write a book with half of this stuff. Yeah. It's unbelievable. But I mean, you figure yeah. that's that's everybody in life. You mean like Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that was when I was like, you know, that was in ninety three, you know. I mean it was just one quick year. It really was because I mean we were getting ready to go on tour with um with Vince Neal. We had, I think they were just about to announce that Sabotage was going to open up for Vince Neal's band, not Motley Crue, but the Vince Neal. Yeah, when he band. did uh, Exposed, I think that's what the album was called. Yeah. Yes. So, and then while we we're waiting for a couple of weeks to go out to open up on that, you know, arena tour, that's when the accident happened. So that was just like probably one of the fastest years I can ever remember. I mean, well, I mean, I was in there in August of 92, so by the time you got to October of 93, it was just over one year that we got to work together, and then boom. I mean, just, uh, it just totally devastated the band. I mean, it took us probably four or five months to even get together and say, what do we want to do? What we, you know, we all knew that Chris would want us to keep going. He, you know, knowing him, he would be sitting there going, are you guys a bunch of pitiful wimps? That we just know that that's the way he was. Get off your ass and and keep this band going. I didn't do all this work for you guys to just wimp out and quit. So we knew, you know, and that was the consensus because we finally got to be, sit down and be able to like stop being like you know traumatized, which which was the case, and then try to get your head out of your ass and say, what is it that we think Chris would want? And it just took so long to get to that point because we were utterly like traumatized. I. I mean, when I first got the news, Johnny Lee called me and said, oh, man, I got some bad news from last night. There was a DUI accident. The guy that hit that, that hit Chris had three prior DUIs, so he went to jail for 10 years. It's unbelievable, too, because you figure with having three I mean, previous, I, that, I mean, you almost the, think that would be life. It was two or it was three, I think, because of the sentence. The back, but remember, they didn't have the same kind of DUI laws here in America in the early 90s. Yeah, no, that's true. Every everything. You had a lot more people with priors, and you had a lot more people with with uh, multiple DUI. And and now, if you even get one, it costs thir- you know twenty five thousand dollars, and you don't drive for six months. So believe me, nobody even wants one now. And if you get to two, you'll basically be losing your license, possibly quite possibly forever. Yeah. I know too. It uh, impacts border crossings as well. Oh yeah, you can't go to Canada. Yep. If we have a DUI here, we cannot go to Canada. Yep, and and vice versa, going the other way. That's right. They got really and believe me, if you had one, you have to report. Like if you're in TSO, and if anybody were to have any incidents like that or any kind of, you know, anything like that, it has to be reported six months ahead before we go. And they probably will make an exception, but it has to be reported, I mean, like a half a year ahead of time that you had something and you're intending to go across the border as a member and they'll give you some concessions. But you, but if you don't let them know in time, we don't bring them. You know, you know what I'm saying? Even if you're in the band yeah. or anything like that, you have to stay behind. And, and somebody sings, or if you're saying, well, I mean, we don't have anybody like that, but you know what I'm saying. Somebody would cover the song or... You know, whoever was affected would just be covered by another player. Well, it makes sense, too. I mean, you guys have such a cast that, I mean, especially if they were a singer or something, right? You could probably pull in someone to cover those. Yeah, yeah. We just, as far as long as I've been, we've never had that. You know what I mean? Like, we don't have people, you know, um, that gets affected by that. But I'm just saying, in the scenario that you are, you're just not going across. I mean, like you said, it's gotten so strict. Geez, if I had a parking ticket, you know, five years ago, they're not letting me across. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not that strict, but it's, it, yeah. <laughs> I swallowed my gum three years ago. I mean, you got to have a, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you got to have, a, colonoscopy. You gotta have a doctor check you out before you come across. That's right. Colonoscopy. <laughs> Remove the piece of gum that stays there for seven years. No, I'm just kidding. You come across now. <laughs> <laughs> 
So tell me this, sort of in the period with Chris, how was it, I mean, you've worked now with Tom and I think Jim or both of them are one at one time, but how was it working with the Morris brothers on Edge of Thorns and especially oh, compared to Bob? Yeah, Fantastic. I've probably done three or four al- albums. When you talk about Sabotage and Circle to Circle, I've probably recorded three or four records with uh, the Morris brothers and especially with Jim. It always Jim was normally... On the records that we worked, uh, that we recorded with Sabotage and Circle to Circle, Jim was the main uh, guy who recorded the tracks, and and you know doing mixing, consulting on mixes, and you know really just kind of moving the faders. Tom is more became as the years went by more of a mastering engineer. So they're kind of two different animals. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're a mastering engineer, you take something that's already mixed. And you do like an EQ process and some peak limiting and things like that, the, the, the things that you do to make a master. And you put the software in there that tells, you know, that, 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 that has to be there present for mass duplication. That's kind of what Tom started getting into as more, you know what I'm saying? So he was kind of making that transition to mastering various people's records. So I wound up working more on the engineering basis with just with Jim and the other assistant engineers. So that's kind of what we did in, in both bands. So I'm guessing, like, was Paul the main producer in the studio then, and Jim was just there to, you know, be the engineer? Yeah, yeah Paul it was not so much of a button pusher, um, more than just kind of saying, hey, we need more of this, let's get this kind of sound. And he would just kind of tell Jim, you know, what he wanted, and Jim dialed it up. And that's really the the... That's the role that, you know, ever since they started going back up to New York to do records. Well, actually, you know, TSO, we uh, own Mara Sound now. The, the, oh, do you really? Yeah, Paul O'Neill purchased Mara Sound uh, four or five years ago, and they named it Night Castle Studios. So it's, the, it's in the same place, it's just called Night Castle. Ah. Yeah. So he bought it from the Morris brothers who, went, who wanted to have a smaller facility because it takes... You know, a lot of upkeep with two major studios in the building. We had Studio A, Studio B, Studio A being the big studio, and Studio B more for tracking. Uh, but it did have a Solid State Logic uh, G Series board in it, which is more than you ever need to mix a record. But then they went ahead. Then they had a SSL J Series. Oh, beautiful! Yeah, in in the A room, which is you know the those preamps and everything, and the compressors are just magic. But um, a friend of mine in Michigan, where I record vocals here. At Sonic Landscapes also has a G series, you know, console that used to broadcast the Oprah Winfrey show, and also Jerry Springer. Oh, that's hilarious! UGN, the big Chicago station. Yeah. So there's always a story with these consoles. Where did they come from? There's only so many. You know what I mean? So it's amazing that every console has its own little story. So, but those consoles, they came from England. So I think the ones that, that Mars Sound bought were just really basically made and shipped for those studio, which is amazing. Because normally they stop somewhere, they may have been used at a, a, a TV station or some kind of broadcasting thing, and then they get moved in the studio, so it's crazy. But yeah, I think they basically purchased those outright. They're very expensive. You know, they run... Oh, they're, they're like 250 grand or something around there. Oh, boy, yeah, I think they're more. I think that some of the J-Series is somewhere up at 750000 and the G series is if you even see them now because they were a '90s console and they hardly they don't make them anymore, so they have mm-hmm. to be completely re- rebuilt. So if you had, let's say, if you had a completely restored one, I think you're looking at 350 grand or more. I mean, they run up to a million. I mean, you, you know, you get Neves, you know, Neve of England. They're all all the best ones are made in England. So if you get a, you can get Neves that cost a million dollars right now, just like that. You know, just no 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 problem. <laughs> You don't have to look very far for a million dollar console. Yeah, you ever heard of uh, a Canadian desk called Ward Beck? Yes, I have. I went to their studio, uh, to, or their facility, if you will, uh, a couple of years ago, and just had my mind blown hanging out with those guys for a day. And oh yeah, oh it's it's just incredible the the tech and the it's it's just it's incredible. You know, the engineering behind all that stuff is just crazy. Yeah, and you know that's a nice board and. Maybe that might be what my friend is going to go to because the G series, I think he's restored it to actually sell it to someone who appreciates that. 
But you got to, you know, they fit in semi trucks. I mean, they're huge. Oh, I mh- mean, you got to have big yeah. trucks. You got to have a big truck. <laughs> And, uh, but yeah, so Paul purchased Morris Sound from the Morris Brothers, who wanted to go have a facility in another town and scale it down. So they have a studio, they have a smaller facility somewhere now. I don't really know exactly what town, but next time I'm in town, I'm going to try to track down Jim, and then try to see where they're at. But yeah, it was cool that TSO owns Morris Sound now. That's unbelievable. <laughs> it's yep. funny because to me, that is such a storied studio. I mean, I probably own 40 records done in there, you know, obviously all the TSO and, and Sabotage and stuff, but just there's, there's so many bands and even you look things up and go, really, that was Morris Sound too? You know, like it's just one of those just legendary metal studios. Yep, known for death metal and everything coming out of Tampa. And, um, you know, there's not that many facilities. That's what Paul was telling me before he bought it. We had a discussion. He goes, you know, Morris Sound's up for sale. They had had a robbery there. There was a well-publicized robbery that happened where somebody somehow got in that place and wiped out a bunch of equipment. And I think that they had found that they tried to put it on some kind of cargo ship and, and get it, you know, get it out of the country and that kind of thing. And I think they actually tracked it down. And I don't, oh, know, I, I don't know the full story, but I think some of it might have been returned and something, and it was just crazy. Insurance was, you know, turned into an insurance settlement and all kind of stuff. And so shortly after that, that's when the Mars Brothers said, you know what? If people are going to come after us like that, I think it's time to retire. <laughs> so, yeah. or, you know, go to a smaller facility. So they just wanted to get where they could get something consolidated that was a little bit more manageable. So... I mean, Paul, we had a conversation about it. He goes, young Zachary, which I will always be young Zachary, no matter <laughs> what age I am. So he goes, you know, facilities like Morris Sound, they hardly exist in America anymore because everybody scaled down with it, with software and pro tools and everything. And you don't need big facilities anymore. He's like, you just don't have this kind of facility anymore. I mean, he said Morris Sound's one of four facilities like that in the country. And I'm like, Wow. Which is true, you know, in today's situation with everything being the electronics and the, the technology being so high. You don't need big facilities and outboard gear. You know, everything, everything's a plug-in. Yep, exactly. It's like you, you need a decent room to track in, and that's about it. That's right, and you can have the SSL pro, you know, the software right on your computer, and you can see every damn piece of the board really sonically. They're getting so close that sonically it's not different. It's just unreal. When you talk about, you know, that kind of technology and every strip, you know, every EQ strip is right there and it does the same thing. And it's like, what? So he said, you know what? I'm really thinking about buying this thing. And I said, you should. That way everything's in house. You can make as many records as you want. and You own the studio. He's like, yep. If I own it, I don't pay studio time anymore. And I'm like, that sounds great to me. Next thing you know, I think a week later, he closed the deal. And that gave the... Morris Brothers, a, a pretty nice, you know, probably nice settlement and allowed them to go do what they want to do. And then what then the first thing they did was put a huge fence wall and everything around that studio. So it would be really safe and not have to have an incident. So there's a gate. Now it's gated. You know what I mean? Like you walk, you go up to it now and you used to be able to just drive on in the driveway. Uh uh-uh. Now you got to have all codes and dial and got to push the thing and they have to spy and see who you are and then open that gate so i like the the added security yeah especially like you say if you're getting broken into and whatever i mean it's the last thing you want in the middle of tracking someone you know comes in and starts bothering yeah it was real mysterious for sure i don't know if they've ever i don't know if they've solved it or anything i think they recovered stuff but they might not have solved who it was and what was the motive and all that so it was very it's interesting I, i i don't know all about it i gotta tell you it would take some research for me to even be educated on it, you know. So, but if anybody wants to look into it, I mean, <laughs> whatever. I mean, I, yeah, I know it. I know that. Pretty sure that it, you know, it happened. But you know, not uh, now. It's very, very secure, and it's got security, and you know, it's all good. Um. So here's a question for you. I'm sure you've probably answered at some point today. But uh, whose idea was it to record Christmas Eve Sarajevo? on Dead Winter Dead, like obviously you guys did, you know, Prelude to Madness and some other kind of classical pieces and other things that you guys were known for. Where did that piece come from? Well, as part of the story, there was a tale 
kind of a well-known uh, story of when the siege of Sarajevo was happening. Oh, you're talking about the uh, the violinist who would play every night, right? The cello. Or, or cello, sorry, cello. He came out, he was so upset about seeing his beautiful Sarajevo being bombed and, and falling prey to the war that, and he was a member of the Sarajevo National Orchestra or something like that. So he kind of said, you know what, I can't, if this is the way it's going to happen, I'm going down there in the square and I'm going to play the cello and this is the way I'm going out. So that actually is a, there's a story there. I don't know if it's 100% corroborated and I, I had heard the guy got, the guy perished doing that. So that's where all that came from. That piece of the story, that's why the song starts out with that cello. And then it was that time of the year. So it was integral to the story, and it was absolutely related to the story of the record. So it made sense, and he said it was on Christmas Eve that this happened, and he went down, and he, the guy felt so horrible about the destruction seeing his you know, beautiful city of Sarajevo being bombed, that he just couldn't take it. And he goes, I, this is, I, I'm going to go out doing what I love, and I'm going to pay you know, a, a homage to the city, and this is my tribute. Um, this is my sacrifice, literally. So that's kind of the piece of the story that prompted the, the song. And you can see where it comes from. It's it was almost integral. And then it wound up being an accidental Christmas hit, and then boom, everything started, you know, and geez, he had to come up with a, we didn't have a follow-up song, it was all metal, it was all metal related to the breakup, of, the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, so we really didn't have a Christmas song, obviously, to, you know, we didn't have anything to follow it up with at Christmas when that song started taking off in America with stations and their sister station and their other sister station saying the phones are going crazy, you know, they want to hear more. So that's when Paul goes, "Uh oh, we better form another band and bring." Now we'll we'll reintroduce this Christmas. We'll reintroduce um, Christmas Eve, Sarajevo 1224 as a single in '97, and that and he goes, "I got to put it on a record with a bunch more Christmas songs." So, believe me, that that was a fast moving thing, and before we knew it, we were watching all those sessions for the. Uh, making of Christmas Eve and other stories, and the rest is history. Yeah, no kidding. Because I, I always wondered that, too. I didn't know if it was sort of like you guys later regrouped and said, let's do TSO, or like you say, if it was sa that blew up on the Sabotage record and then made you do it. So now I know the yes, answer. It blew up, yes, it blew up on the Sabotage record. Uh, we started getting offers to play all kind of little you know, festivals and stuff, Sabotage, because of that. And then we'd get there, and we'd crank up the metal, and they go, wait a minute. I thought it was like a Christmas thing. Now it's just a bunch of metal. It's a bunch of heavy metal from Tampa. <laughs> so you know what I mean? It was a little bit confusing. So that's when Paul said, okay, we got to cut out the confusion. And we're going to come out with a absolutely non-confusing, dedicated Christmas band, Trans-Siberian Orchestra. And he goes, I'm telling you what. He said, I'm going to work this thing until Sarajevo, Christmas Eve, Sarajevo 1223 is the most played Christmas song in, in American radio history. And I'm telling you, I think we already have that. <laughs> I, think we've already, I think we've already met that goal. Yeah. Well, I think maybe as far as rock, I mean, I don't know if you can yeah, rock. You know, That's beat, right. beat some, yeah, like, you know, Rock Around the Christmas Tree, I don't think really, That's really right. or, or whatever is the number one song. That's yeah, true. I know That's true. Yeah. But yeah, on, on, you know, modern rock radio, I think, you know, yeah, yeah, modify yeah. that. Um, so, yeah, I think we've definitely probably met a few of those goals, you know. So that's that's crazy to hear that. And then all of a sudden, you know, like 21 years later, you're going, well, all right. Uh, I think we pretty much got that in some in some form or fashion. Yeah. Um, so with Dead Winter Dead, obviously, you know, Chris is gone. What was the writing sessions like for that album? Are there a lot of leftover older songs? Like, were you guys able to regroup and rehearse a lot and bring in new members and kind of build it back up? Or it was just something you sort of put out there to kind of keep moving forward? Um, that And what which song again? Well, ju just kind of the whole record in general, like the sessions for that. and Because so, you guys sort of had to rebuild the band in a sense and come from this very dark place to make that record, right? Um, Handful of Rain? Or sorry, <laughs> you're right, I jumped ahead of record. Yes, Handful of Rain, thank you. Yes, we, 
Well, basically everything for Handful of Rain, very little existed before we went in to make it. So we had to make the decision, number one, does the band move on? You know, yes, okay, we got there. Now we need to, you know, do the typical thing. John Oliva can pop out songs and he can basically bust out songs at an amazing rate. So that's what he did. Uh, Him and Paul got together. And then, you know, we came up with Chance. That marked the beginning of kind of a new era for Sabotage, you know, thinking about songs like that. And that, they said, John, according to John, he says that was really his first step realizing that he could be able to do stuff that could succeed with something like TSO, even though TSO had not been thought of yet. You know, he kind of credits chance and the thinking that created chance as the the confidence builder that says, hey, we can do other stuff. We can, you know, really flex and transition. So I think you got to think about the fact that we were sabotaging. If you think about what TSO has done through the years, it, it's, it's that ability to modify what you already did with sabotage and modify that to be something like successful Christmas music. And, and you know, John is one of the few people in the world that could ever make that modification. It's not just easy. I, I can say it, but it's easier said than done. So it's just pretty amazing how he did that, how he twists and the twists and turns that happened, you know, to make it uh, like a TSO sound. You can hear the similarities now. Of course, you can hear that guitar, and you can hear the drums and go, man, I've heard that somewhere before. It sounds like Sabotage, but, I mean, those hints are there. Those basic sounds are there, but gosh, so many things happen musically to make that transition. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I've, I always thought that was a brilliant move to turn it into a Christmas band, and I think one of the big things was changing the name, because I like the name Sabotage, but TSO is just such a, it goes so far beyond metal as the band does. You yeah, know? it leaves so much room to do what you want, you know, and to just not have limitations. That's another thing I hear John say all the time. One way you get to TSO music is don't put yourself in a box. You, you know, you got to think outside the box and really, you know, n- don't be afraid to really make some bold you know, changes and and think of it as the sky is the limit rather than, you know, putting yourself in some kind of a, you know, mold. And I'm glad that they didn't stick to the mold. You know, they created new molds and and it really thought outside the box. Mm -hmm. Tell me now um, about building up your, at the time was new, um, band Circle to Circle. Especially, I mean, that first record I thought was really funny because to me, Sabotage was still active at the time, as as what I thought I knew. And then I see you're building up a new band, Circle to Circle, and I think there were a couple demos of um, Watching in Silence and a few other songs came out far before the record came out that I heard. How was it building that band up sort of from the ground up into that record? Well, Sabotage activity started kind of dwindling down around 2000. Or a little bit after that. So, what I what John and I were interested in is kind of having a collaboration, and that's sort of what Circle to Circle was started by. It was just a collaboration of me and John, with a little bit of Chris Caffrey coming in there. So basically, I was just writing songs along with John, and it was going to give us another outlet to play with Sabotage, kind of transitioning completing the transition to TSO. He knew he was going to be working on TSO records, but Sabotage wasn't doing too much. So it was kind of just an outlet for us to kind of have another, you know, musical thing to do. Yeah. So when, you know, you're not doing Christmas music all the time. Right. And I, I don't really think there were too many demos. I don't know where that would have come from coming out. It honestly might be an, I don't I don't know if it was a demo or maybe an early mix. I don't know how I ever got it. It was, you know... Well, essentially, it could have been a... You know, it might have been one of the early demos that leaked out or something like that. We didn't have too many things out there before the record. It was one of those things where we kind of just wrote stuff, and the next thing you know, I signed on a record deal with AFM, a German label, and we had a pretty good deal, so there was money to, you know, to pay everybody to record and, you know, have a decent budget to, you know, make the record. Mm -hmm. And we were pretty much straight into the studio. You know, we had ideas. I was writing lyrics 
and that was my job to work on the vocal melodies with John and that was it so um, it really was just going to be one album you know we were just thinking okay let's just do this album we'll call it Circle to Circle and that's it because we're tying together the circles of sabotage coming together with the circle of John and myself and a circle of friends was kind of the way it came about that you know that had friends from the previous band sabotage and then we're forming a new alliance you know so we really didn't think it was really going to do to you know and then they said okay let's do the second one and me and john still did the same thing we did the same kind of thing then as we got into the third and fourth and you know five six seven john said ah this thing's kind of on its own now i'll just bow out you know so then like you know we had different writers me and mitch stewart and kind of distance up the Christian Wentz there towards the end was joining us and yeah it just kind of went off in all kind of directions it was just one of those things where I said you know what let it go where it wants to go you know it's gonna it went so many different ways it was just a, a thing on its own we didn't really worry too much about it we were like okay whatever you come up with all right let's just do the best we can right stuff and it was just a crazy it was like a, a snake that had been let loose it was just going all over the place so it was kind of wild but it was you know it was fun we had a lot of fun tours and stuff like that and it kept everybody a little bit busy um i was at home with my young children through most of the history of circle circle so i didn't have to do too much i could just tour a little bit and and be there, you know, in the formative years. And now that the kids are older, I've kind of got back back into music full time. Yeah. Is there any plans to do another Circle to Circle, or is that band put to rest now? Um, it's, uh, it's not over, you know. We've never made an announcement like, we'll never do anything again. I mean, that, we, that hasn't happened. It's kind of like hibernation. It's a bear, and it's wintertime, and it's hibernating. And it needs something to wake it up. Now, I don't know what that something's going to be or what that, you know, opportunity would be or inspiration or whatever, but, I'm, you know, it may or may not reawaken, but it's more, I just kind of talk about it being in a hibernating state because everybody's off doing other things. And, you know, obviously I got Archangel and, you know, Bill's playing with Doro and North Tail and Mitch is working on other, like, Christmas projects and things, solo albums and... Christian has a, a thriving computer business, so everybody's just kind of real busy right now. So either life has to loosen its talons on some of them, uh, on some of us, or you know, just make the time. You know, I just got to find. You know, right now we're just lacking in the time necessary to to keep that project awake right now. Sure. I'm doing oh, yeah. what, you know, geez, now that I got TSO and now we got Archangel and just, oh, man, you know, other stuff that might happen. And, you know, my, I even might make a solo record at some point, Zach Stevens, which has never been done. I've had every band name in the world, but not Zach Stevens. I mean, I'm still plugging away. We're writing little things um, all the time. We're putting new ideas down for that. So one day it might be this wild and different, you know, record called that. I mean, so there's just all kind of, you know, stuff going on. So it would have to settle down a little. All right. Well, since you've mentioned the new band, and I think we're about at that point chronologically, so let's talk about Archangel. Um, so I know you did this, um, like you say, with a band of Italians. Tell me how this whole project comes together. Um, I'm working on Timo Tolki's Avalon record, Return to Eden. I sang two songs on the first one, and here comes Return to Eden, and it's on a new label. It's, it happens to be on Frontiers. I, I wasn't involved in Frontiers at the time. Our guitarist is Aldo uh, Lono Bile. He happens to be writing songs with Timo and producing the Return to Eden album, okay? And I'm singing two songs. So Aldo pops up and says, hey, I'm Aldo. I want to send you some songs. Can you choose two that you want to sing? Uh, Timo wants you to sing two more songs on the record. So I said, sure, all right, all right. I was happy that Tivo wanted me back, and, you know, we work well together. Uh, we pick out two songs. I go in the studio here in Michigan at my friend, my great friend, uh, Jimmy Shellberg at Sonic Landscapes, who I was talking about earlier. A little gem of a studio in a very small town, Jackson, Michigan. 
with his G series board and all the great outdoor gear. And I'm like, oh man, great choice of mics. Go in and cut them. Everything went good. The tracks sound good. So then, next thing I hear, two or three months later, Aldo goes, "Hey, Frontiers likes really likes the um, stuff you you know saying on uh, Return to Eden. They want us to do a record together. Would you like to do that?" And I said, "Yeah, why not? We work well together. You know, we, me and Aldo can slap together more stuff than you can imagine. We don't ha- worry that we're across the world from each other. It doesn't matter. You know, we got the we got the technology. So." We seem to have similar tastes in music and similar influences. So I said, yeah, that would probably be pretty good. So then, you know, he starts sending me song ideas. And, you know, I was like, all right, that sounds like, you know, pure metal to me, you know, whatever the kind of stuff we do. Um, And I would give some suggestions like, hey, do you have anything like, so, you know, just had a lot of ideas. We had four guys in the band writing music. They ask us, well, we need a name. We need, you know, like, what do you want to do? He goes, you want to write lyrics and do you want to put the vocal melodies down? What do you want to do? And I went, well, I kind of just want to kind of do what I used to do with Sabotage, do the vocals and, you know, be a consultant to everything. You know, the mix, the production, the final touches, the arrangements and vocal melodies. So he said, okay, good. What about lyrics? I said, I want my wife Catherine to write the lyrics because she's a lot better at that than me. I, and my, and that's what I think. I mean, I'm good, but not that good. And it would take some of the burden off of me, and I could kind of enjoy the process a little bit more without that weighing down of like you have to write all the lyrics. So, so I'm like, okay, I just want to have fun here. So I'm going to go within the goals of a good team effort, and we want to have fun, and we don't want to get stressed out. All right, I'm not at that point in my career where I want to be super stressed out about a new band. So we said, we're going to do that. He goes, what about a name? So we're sitting there, me and my wife, Catherine, are walking around the neighborhood on many of our long seven or eight mile walks we take every day in the, well, when it's not in this cold weather. I think it's snowing right now. We just got a snowstorm that came across. But um, so we're just kind of tossing names around, you know, and just brainstorming and stuff. And she goes, have you ever heard of that Greek Gnosticism? And I'm like, yeah, I have, but I don't know anything about it. She goes, a very well, not a well-known religion of of the Greek, uh, ancient Greek uh, time frame. But she said they got archons that are supposed to be the medium and the, the go-between between the people of Earth and the gods. If the people of Earth ever want to talk to the gods, you got to have an archon. I said, that sounds pretty cool. Well, how do you spell that? Okay, A R C H O N. What are they? Well, they're angels, is what I went, oh, like Archon Angel? And she goes, yeah, I was thinking that might, I said, that sounds pretty good. So I kind of wrote it down on paper, and it kind of looked good. And I said, speaking of that, why don't we just go with that whole thing and make a story about an Archon and his life? He gets called up to save, to help the people of Earth with bad situations, but he doesn't want to do it. He's just like a regular rich executive businessman who's got an alcohol and drug problem, and he doesn't want to do it at all, but the gods don't give up. They go, you don't have a choice. We're choosing you for special powers you have, and only you have them, but you don't know it yet, but you're going to know it. He's like, what? And so you get the whole thing about denial, anger, I don't want to do it, to acceptance, to, you know, be feeling the power, to recognizing the power, to honing the power, reigning in the power, and actually doing the stuff for the people of Earth. And I'm like, well, that sounds like a mouthful. Um, I think I can go with this. So will it, I said, will it give us inspiration for lyrical content and everything? And based on how the song sounds? She's like, absolutely. So I went, guess what? You're hired. <laughs> so, so basically, it's a big team. We have probably eight people that in the side the band, outside writers, um, influencers, um, concept influence outside the band. So I like it. I said, let's put a nice team together and let's just have a great team effort because I'm going to go back to what Paul O'Neill used to tell me. Young Zachary, it's all about the album. You have to sweat it and you have to painfully pay attention to detail and 
really give it the time of day and the necessary resources and everything and sweat the details to make the great record. If you don't, nothing else is going to fall in place. So I told all the guys, I want to give you some Paul O'Neill wisdom. So everybody listened, and we communicated well during the tracking. Every guy in the band, I didn't even meet them until we were about to play 70,000 tons of metal. I met them the day before in a rehearsal in person but we all were you know talking online and stuff like that and uh they were sending rehearsal mp3s to me so i could rehearse my part to their rehearsal tape so like you had to rehearse in much more non-traditional manner you know <laughs> to get yeah. for the current first couple of shows because i didn't have time to go to italy you know to sit in but it, you know we just did it electronically so to speak um so that's kind of a little bit of background on how the whole thing started and how it kind of wound up doing the first two shows. That's unreal. So you guys have one rehearsal before you did 70,000 tons, eh? Like one proper rehearsal, rather. Yes, one in-person rehearsal, probably six hours in a studio in Miami. Rehearsal, a very nice place. And I had to take it easy because being having to play the next night, you know, it, it's hard. It, you lose, like, you can keep singing and keep singing and keep singing. That's okay. But then before you know it, you've sang five or six hours and you're like, oh, crap. To, it's a delayed reaction, as you know. Like, how is this going to feel tomorrow? You know, it might feel fine right then, but so I had to really kind of like try to be careful. It didn't really work that well. I was still beat up, but you know, we pulled everything off, and we had a little bit of luck. We needed some luck, and you always need a little bit of luck. So luckily, that happened enough to get it done, and. One of the show we played the first show on the main stage of any band after the ship took off. We were practically on the stage within 20 or 30 minutes of the ship leaving the port. We played that. That went very well. But the next, two days later, we had to go. There was a windstorm where they were canceling bands off the pool deck the night before. So the wind got so strong they had to remove the whole tarp, you know, from the from the trusses of the pool deck stage because the wind was just too high. It was coming in at like 60 miles an hour. So the storm passed, but we are on we are on the schedule to play at 10 a.m. the next morning. First of all, I don't think I've ever sang that early. So I had to get up at like 6.30 in the morning. And then they had taken all the tarp off so it didn't hold the wind, you know, so it didn't catch the wind. And, and the winds were down to 50 knots. So the loudest thing I had in my in-ear mix was the wind coming through the various mics. And the wind, it was continuous. It was blowing stuff. and But the PA did a good job. You didn't have the sound blowing away as bad as I thought. Because you can get swirly, you know, with the swirling wind. It's kind of like taking the high end and, you know. We had a big crowd. They all came in at 10 because we had a good first show. So we drew nice. And so it, it turned out to be all right, but it was a struggle. Like, I was just feeling like, oh, my God, physically just get me through this second show. And, wow, I'm still tired from the TSO run. I didn't have a chance to recuperate. And then you have these two challenging shows on the ship. And I was like, what did I get myself into? I had that long rehearsal. I was still kind of reeling from, you know, all that, you know, just the travel, getting to Miami from Pittsburgh, where we were staying and uh i you know i somehow got through it i just needed some luck yeah so that was it it sounds like you guys did pretty good because i actually i went to see sons of apollo the other night in battle creek yes and we're waiting in line outside and you just start gabbing with random you know as you do standing in line nothing else to do so you make buddies in line and everyone's into metal so Anyways, I mentioned, I said, oh, I'm going to be talking, because someone mentioned Sabotage or TSO or something. I said, oh, actually, I'm going to be talking to Zach in a few days. And they all had been on 70,000 tons. And they said, yeah, we saw the new band. They were great. And I went, awesome, because the record's great. So, you know, especially considering, I didn't know you guys didn't even really, you know, you'd won rehearsal. So, I mean, that's a testament to everyone in the band is a pretty seasoned musician, right? So... That definitely helps. Yeah, they played in. Yeah, there's a couple of guys that were in Secret Sphere with Aldo, so they played together. With him, that's uh, Marco the drummer. We had Alessandro Del Vecchio on keyboards. He plays with Hardline and a bunch of other people. So, you know, we had the seasoned musicians 
and you know it was just a matter of avoiding the cold that everybody had everybody's getting a cold and even people in my band aldo got a cold and everything by the by the time the second show because on the ship it's just a lot of cruises just have a lot more germ potential and people just seem to like get sick they drink a lot that that ship has a ton of drinking going on um so it lowers the immune system you know what i'm saying so it's just like that's always tough the ship shows I've, I've played it three times i played number two let me see or number one i can't remember that no i think it was number two number four number ten so the two and four was with circle to circle so i know the challenges you know so <laughs> well i think i think you get the same people in a confined space for x amount of days too yes. the one or two people bring colds on the ship and eventually everybody just gets it yeah they they call it the seventy thousand plague or something i don't know what every year or something but <laughs> Yeah, I love that Nam. They call it Namthrax, and I think that's yeah, just the Namthrax. perfect word. <laughs> that's right, Namthrax, because it's that time of year, which is you know flu season, and then you know of course that doesn't help because that's promoting everything, and then everybody's in that confined space. So believe me, I I think I don't know if I've caught anything at Nam, but I've heard that a lot. It was like, but you know we're off and running. We're just a regular young band, and we're just going to take it one step at a time and take it slow. I'm not trying to take on too much at once because if you do that, you're going to start discombobulating everybody and then everybody's going to, you know, we're going to have problems. So I have to pace it. So we're starting off the tours like the many, as many tours and just trying to go into a territory. We hadn't been in a long time this time, Greece and Cyprus and back to Turkey, which I've only played one other time in my life. So, and that was a circle to circle at a festival. So yeah, we're just going to try to put that together and hope for the best and that's it and come home and be working i'm sure by then i'll have to do a ton of work for tso because we work all year round you know working on new stuff new songs whatever if they have needs for different things and demos and we do a lot of videos but um well i know a couple of years ago it might even be 10 now that i think about it but i know you guys did a run in the spring throughout north america especially like smaller cities and that kind of thing sort of picking up the other areas you didn't hit did you guys do that often every year or was that more of a one-off kind of thing no that was probably the time we played like wisconsin and chicago in 2011 that may be it honestly i don't remember the exact date i was actually i you guys played locally here in windsor and i wanted to see you i've seen you a couple other times but um that for whatever reason i couldn't go and so i just remember you coming through it was like april or may or something uh... The uh, the only time circle you're talking about circle to circle, no no no, no sorry uh, TSO. Oh yes yeah that was yeah that was a, a number of years back and that's when we used to have more shows in Canada. That was around um, maybe o nine or o six or seven, as as far as I understand it was before I was out there singing with them. So you're right. Lately it's only been Toronto and that's once that's twice in three years. No, twice in five years. Oh, wow. So Toronto's not even a regular date for you guys. Eh? No. It, we played it in 2015, my first year, and we just played it in 2019. So it's been two dates in five years. And that's it. Oh, and that's 2015, crazy. we had another show. It was, not, it was Toronto and something else. I'm thinking we'll probably increase that. They may add more dates for this coming year because we got that third band coming. Oh, there's going to be a third one now. Yeah, we're going to have a third band for the middle of the country for the to work the middle of the country with um, with the seven thousand six thousand seater capacity thing instead of the ten thousand and up. They want to cover some of those smaller markets that can put you know six or seven thousand people in there and uh, and do that total market. So now we got. Three bands, so all new people. I think it's going to be all new members. It could be coming from the backup band. You know, they might they might take it from the backup band people that are existing now who are on call. We have to have all these contingency plans, you know, for the winter tour. But uh, it may come from that. But I, I understand it's going to be totally new, so we don't have to steal people from the existing companies. Which people don't want to see all that change. People get used to it, you know. The East people, you know, the crowd that sees the East wants to see the wants to see the same people, and the crowd that sees the West wants to see, you know, Jeff Scott Soto and Al Petrelli and all that, you know. Do you guys ever switch, or is it just 
you're the East forever, you're the West forever. There's been some rare switching depending on business need, but that's very rare. Um, normally, when you get placed somewhere, that's where you're at. Ah, uh, okay. And I don't mind. I like the East Coast, and um, that's perfect for me. Well, it's where you live, too, so I'm sure that helps. Yeah. It's the original market. It's the original true market of TSO. So we take a little bit of pride in the East because it's the original market. It's the market that started the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It all started on East Coast stuff. New York, Florida, the original radio stations, and kind of built like that Chicago and stuff. I don't know. We trade off with the West on that, but there's a little bit of something that on, East, on, all, on both bands that people have a lot of pride about. And that, that's fine. That keeps everybody happy, you know, and excited, you know, stuff like that. But it's not really a competition. It's just, it's really when you look, you know, we are looking at it as one big band, you know. It, it's not really looked at like, you know, East versus West. You know, we, we never do that because it doesn't make sense to do that. It's not. It's, it's one entity and we are doing everything for the whole. But now there's going to be three bands that are having that attitude. How about that? So it's going to be up to the new, you know, the younger band to show the other two guys up, right? <laughs> well, there's probably more pressure on the new band, I would imagine, because they're going to be new to it, you know what I mean? But there'll be a lot of interest. It's probably going to pull people from that watch both coasts and, and have them move over a little bit to watch what goes on with this new band. It's going to be very interesting, the dynamic of the fans, how they move around. It just brings up a lot of logistical questions because... I'm sure that a lot of people want to take a sneak peek, which is good. It's good for curiosity, and that might help things. You know, people getting curious about what's going on with this third band. See, I'm going to call them Central because we got East, West, and Central. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're calling it, but I guess that's just what I call it for now. But um, if I was a fan, I'd be interested to go watch Central because it's new. Absolutely. Yeah, every time I've gone out, it's been the obviously the East group, right? So I've never seen the West, and I mean, Central sounds like it might still be close to where I live, so I mean, that would be very cool as well. And just waiting to see who actually gets added to this band. Right. You know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and how that process goes and stuff, so it's going to be interesting, and all the original Sabotage guys, like us six or whatever, we'll just sit there. The old guard just gets to sit there and go, my, my, how things are changing. <laughs> our, what's happening with our baby now? <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of funny, but um, I'm looking to go as long as I can possibly go. You know, I think it should be pretty good. Um, I've always wondered this, though. How do you, when it comes to TSO, how do you guys, like, prepare and rehearse are you guys like Skyping all the time or do you all get together in one building or like what, what do you guys do to uh, get that all up and running for the tours? Well, we have rehearsal for about close to two weeks. Usually it runs about 12 days and we go to Omaha, Nebraska and we do both bands in one arena that, that we rent out uh, for a long time now. They've been renting out the Mid-America Center. Um, in in uh, is close to Omaha. It's actually over there across the state line. I forgot what town that is, but it's uh, in Iowa. Is that right? Those they all come together right there, Nebraska, Iowa, and I almost had it. I'll get it in a second. But anyway, rent the arena out. We got the West Coast band on one end and the East Coast band on the other end. They're twin shows, so it's the best way to make sure that you're matching every. Oh, it's Council Bluffs. Council Bluffs, Iowa is the is the location of the arena. So basically, you can match up to make sure every aspect of the production is completely matching up um, when you do it with one band in one end of the arena and the other band at the other end. So that's the way we do it. We take about upwards of two weeks preparing in the small room. We get the music together. Then as the stage is being built – they practically build the stages as we start rehearsals. So by the time they get the big stage built, the East Band that I'm in goes on. It's the first stage built. We go on there and take the show to the big stage and start working it in. Then what we'll do is we'll play there for a few days. We'll go back to the rehearsal rooms. Then the West Band goes and takes the big stage because you can only have one band playing at the same time on the big stage. So we alternate. And yield to the other guys. And then before you know it, everything's good. We do dress rehearsals at the very end. Sometimes they make, they film everything for Hallmark Channel because we're sponsored by Hallmark Channel, uh, which is a kind of a Christmassy, very Christmassy channel. 
they start showing Christmas stuff in July. They go Christmas in July, and then the rest of the ba- year you can watch you watch Christmas movies on Hallmark. So it is perfect partnership, and they're great. They give us a lot of good sponsorship stuff to help us on tour, and um, that's basically how that's prepared. It is all done in person and all right there in the arena. So on uh, sort of that note, um, so besides you've got the new Archon Angel and TSO is obviously going to be a thing, um, like you say, for as long as you can do it and are a part of it. Uh, do you have any other big plans? Sort of you mentioned the solo album. Are there plans for Archon Angel to continue in the future, do you think? Yeah, we have a multiple album deal. So that kind of sets the stage for you know multiple records. So we're looking forward to do that when, if and you know whatever I say, not if, but when the time comes, because it is you know stated that they're kind of we're expected to do two or three, um, at least you know, and after that they can pick up the option you know if they want it to go more. But yeah, we'll take it one record at a time. But I would say you know, at least looking at one more, and if things go well, it'll keep on going as appropriate. So we'll have that, and then. Like I said, this solo thing will come around eventually. It'll be pretty different and really cool. I think I'll play drums on that. And uh, that way I can kind of like do two things and, you know, have a little bit more of a different time. It's always interesting making records, having to go from drum world to vocal world. It's like, um, am I done with drum world yet? Okay, now I make the walk over to the other room. Now I'm making the transition to vocal world. You know, it's just kind of like two different worlds. I kind of like that. Obviously, we do most of the drums first, so that comes first, but it'll be interesting. And we've got some pretty damn good stuff that we've compiled already. You know, we're just kind of adding to it. When So when the time comes, that'll be something to kind of look forward to. I guess that's probably about it, unless something else pops up, you know, which could. Seems like everything's kind of going nuts right now, so... Ah, who knows what could happen. <laughs> I don't, I'm going to do some guest appearances I have about two or three guest appearances just with, you know, one song or two songs from different bands internationally lining up right now that have been interested to have me sing a song. I usually do about two or three or four guest appearances a year uh, on somebody's record somewhere in the world that they want to have my, you know, me sing a song that they think is appropriate or if they have guest vocalists. I'll be doing a couple of those in the next couple of months. Try to avoid uh, shows on ships for a year or two. No. <laughs> <laughs> I forget who I interviewed, um, but they said, they'll. <laughs> he said, I don't really know what the future holds, but I'll bet you in a few weeks will be something to keep me busy. That's, yep, that's right. Who said that? I'm, I'm drawing a blank on who it was now, but... I mean, it's it was somebody like yourself who's obviously done a number of projects, a few you know bigger bands and all the rest of it, right? And I'm I'm drawing a blank now, but I always it sounds that familiar was because geez, that's kind of the way I think right now. You know, it's like well, I don't really, but in a few weeks, you know, yeah, because it always seems like something bubbles up, you know, and I'm like, does that me? Because that really sounds like my life right now. <laughs> like, but um, yeah, hey, oh, hey, great talking to you, man. We'll stay in touch. Uh, you know, as needed, and uh, appreciate all the time. Oh, of course. Zach, no, that's that's no worries, so I really do appreciate it. You got it. Um, you just protect Baby Yoda. <laughs> hey, thanks again, man. Good talking to you, and I'll uh, catch up with you later. All right. Thanks so much, Zach. Yeah. Much appreciated. See you later, Brent. All right. Yep. All right. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Welcome to the Monday's Inception.